The following is a production of Dirty Mo Media. Hey, everybody, and welcome in uh, to the Dale Jr. Download. Is it, is it our official title for Tuesday? Yeah, okay. Dale Jr. Download. Right. And, and by the, uh, this is the part where already right now, like in the truck, you're like, well, who the hell is this? Because this is not <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr. This is Ryan McGee uh, from ESPN. Uh, we are live, semi-live, mm. r- from the Bojangle studio. And uh, here, as always, with Curlin. And with Dalton, yes, sir. All right, Dalton. I got. I'm gonna get. To the, I don't know you. Okay. I've known Curlin since he was like four years old. <laughs> um, but four and when, three quarters. How often? I'm of a certain age, right? Okay. How often do you get Roadhouse references in your life? All the time. Okay. I get. I used to get uh, <laughs> gifts of like Patrick Swayze yeah. on the cover and everything. Okay. Like, uh, the story goes that my mom, uh, while she was pregnant with me, was watching the movie, and my dad came home, and she goes. I think I found a name that I like. And he no. goes, looks at the TV and goes, Dalton? And she said, yep. No, what she said was, what she said <laughs> was, was like from the movie, the name. The name. Is Dalton. Yeah. yeah I, that's it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Thought, I thought you'd be bigger, all that. Yep. Yeah. And I'm, now, yeah. so now, and now about the time it's died down, there's a new roadhouse coming. Yeah. Which yeah. I'm so excited Jake for. Jake Gyllenhaal, by the way, who my wife is obsessed with, is super ripped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there's like wrestlers in it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so. I digress. Welcome into the Dale Jr. Download for Tuesday. It is the post Las Vegas edition uh and yeah dale jr was nice enough to um and mike were nice enough to call and ask for me to come in and sit and i think it's a big deal right i don't think dale's ever missed a show and if you're wondering where he is he is on spring break with the family Mm -hmm. um you know he's a girl dad which i can relate to um what's crazy to me is uh, all right so so folks don't know i wrote a book with dale jr um which is it was six years ago Dang. We, we fought, so the final, the reason I, I, I bring this up in relation to the girls, because Isla was born as we were finishing the book. Wow. Holy cow. And I was kind of panicky because I had, you know, no one understands what having a first kid is. Like it is, it is, you don't, you think you know what it's going to be and you do not know what it's going to be. And so I remember saying to Dale, dude, we got to get this done. We have to get this done. We have to get this done. And we got in a late start on the book, and he's like, oh, it'll be fine. I go, no, no, you don't understand. When the baby comes, right. this is, we're done. Like, you don't, no, 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 we'll be fine, man. We'll be fine. And I remember, I, so I'm very proud of this fact. I am one of the first people to see Isla. Like, I'm talking about, like, Amy and Dale and the doctors and the folks that work, you know, on Dale's property, yeah. and like Dale's mom, and like me. Wow! Like I showed up, and again, I showed. I said, "Oh, just come up Wednesday, like we'd planned." All right, and I show up, and it was like a diaper bomb had gone off, like because you just don't know, you have no idea. And so I kind of always, I know how old Isla is, and I know how old the book is because they were essentially born at the same time. Isla was born, and we finished the manuscript for the book just a couple of weeks later, and then the book came out in the fall of 2018 but it's crazy to believe that that was six years ago but 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 we'll we'll talk about that but what a what an experience but yeah thank you all for having me i'm I'm excited to be talking some racing here yeah you know in in the dojo you're you said you're a girl dad so like you probably know what the girl dad spring break is what do you think dale's doing right now well all right so i heard the show last week and i was just laughing about him taking the girls to the american girl doll (laughs) store which he kept calling it something else he kept calling the the american doll store yeah Yeah. you go the the american doll store is a different store that's like (laughs) that's like the janky outlet mall version of american girl doll so (laughs) then i was like dude you don't understand so i live right near south park mall in south charlotte and and we didn't have the american girl doll store my daughter was going to the closest one was in atlanta so oh, we dang. would drive to atlanta to do that but no no i, I was i just had one only a girl uh i didn't there were not girls in my house growing up uh, i had a brother all my, most of my cousins were guys my girl cousins lived on the west coast it was all dudes all the time and so i learned very quickly about barbie and american girl doll <laughs> and uh you know the brats and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but i but whatever i owned it man i would carry i'd carry the backpack there's so many pictures of me walking around the mall walking around new york walking to to beach which i think is where the earnharts are now and i got to i got the barbie backpack dude that's just how that's how it rolls and these dads that try to act like they're not going to do that i'm like well then you know okay but you know you're going to pay the price my daughter who's a freshman in college now we're very close and i swear i think it goes back to and i've talked to dale jr about this about you know being involved from the jump and that means you know what that means you're playing with barbies that's just how that goes dang yeah so girl dad that's me man (laughs) yeah and she likes race cars um she likes certain race car drivers um i always it's funny when she was little uh my daughter uh, i I never forget i took her to there was a press conference at the nascar hall of fame 
and my wife was on the road for work and my daughter's probably like four and never met a stranger and there's a press conference at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. They're like, hey, could you come to this? I'm like, I can't do it. I'm like, I'm on dad duty all day. Well, just bring her. It'll be fine. I'm like, all right. So I brought my daughter to the NASCAR Hall of Fame. We're in the parking deck. And Richard Petty is walking through the parking deck. And I roll down the window, and he sees my daughter strapped into the car seat, walks over to the truck. And he's like, hey. And she, she knew who he was. I mean, he's the king. He's Mr. The King, right, from Cars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my daughter's never met a stranger, and she froze. And he's talking to her and leaning in the window, and she completely froze. And he walks off. I'll never forget. She looked in the rearview mirror at me, and she goes, Dad, I blew it. <laughs> I, I, no, it's fine. So I took her inside. But, no, my daughter met David Pearson. My daughter met Kel Yarborough. You know, my daughter, Dale Jr., my daughter had a great time. We had a book signing for the book, and Dale Jr. actually came to our house and, like, changed clothes because he had an event to go to downtown. And he sat in the living room and, like, watched TV with her. I mean, she just she's been around race car drivers her whole life. She thinks I think she when she was a kid thought everybody hangs out race car drivers. That's, just, that's what <laughs> dad did. So yeah, yeah. So girl dad, I can I can relate. But yeah, that Dell Jr.'s at the beach. Um and, and I'm sure they're having a good time right now. And as we speak, they're probably hauling about four bags and mm. three red wagons of yeah. crap down to the beach. Yeah. That's, that's, you don't travel light with girls. Little girls are like the old lady from Titanic. Like everywhere <laughs> they go, there's like four boxes of stuff and trunks and all that. So that, that that's just that's how you roll and that, that's the gig. Dang. Beach yeah. day. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to get in their bathing suit, but then they do. And then, like, you got to put sunscreen on them, and they don't want that. And then it gets in their eyes and all that stuff, but it's, but it's still the best. And once you get yeah. down there, it's fine. So yeah. it's all good. So that's a, so if you wonder what Dale Jr. is doing right now, Dale, if you're listening to the podcast, that's our guest. First, thanks for listening. <laughs> and, and second of all, uh, good luck with uh, hauling them down to the beach. Yes. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned, like, the, the book that obviously you wrote with Dale. Um, we have this great clip that you sent us, and I think this is the perfect time that we got to play it. Yeah. It's uh, Daytona 2000, I think 19. It was 19, so the book had come out in the you fall, like October. Um, and then, and I, it's funny, I had not seen Dale. We dropped the book, we did one book signing together. And so when you're the with guy, I always say I'm the New York Times bestselling with guy. You know, it's, it's Dale <laughs> yeah. Hart Jr. with Ryan McGee. Right. And, and it was very, and honestly, if you read a lot of books that are written by, you know, sports figures, movie stars, famous people. A lot of times, the 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 with person doesn't get any recognition at all. And Dale was very adamant up front about including me in it, which I'm very thankful for. But yeah, so we had not seen each other very much because he went off and did the Today Show and all that stuff. And and it was fun to watch, you know, from a distance. But we kind of sent the book out the door. But then the next time I saw him in person, really, certainly after the end of the season, was. At Daytona, when I think it was Grand Marshal of the Daytona yeah. 500, they brought him in for a press conference, and this is what happened. Let's go to Ryan. Uh, Ryan McGee, ESPN. Dell, I wanted to ask you, what's been the response to your book, which is available at fine bookstores all over the world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. We've become very good friends. I'm so thankful for that. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was so uh, I just said, uh, you know, what's been the reaction to your book? Which you know, I like way, how I, you said fine bookstores. Yeah. Fine bookstores that all around the world. That was my favorite part <laughs> of the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. But you know what? But what he said right there meant a lot to me because, um, you know, the, the headliner is the laugh and all that. But but what he says at the end has always meant more to me than I've ever told him because mm. we did become great friends in that, and there's no way that wouldn't happen um, because he was so incredibly open and honest and vulnerable from the jump and the reality is is that we knew each other and we had been or certainly around each other we had interviewed him a thousand times um press conferences and whatever else i mean i I remember i was there when he made his bush series debut i mean i've been literally been there beginning of his career end of his career we weren't that close like you know he was close to certain you know he and marty basically grew up together but but dale and i my approach was always very different with the drivers like I, i i if you ever seen the movie almost famous don't make friends with the rock stars and so I always kind of kept guys at a distance because what if I had to cover something bad? You know, what if I had to write something bad about them? And, and it w- w- I didn't want that to alter, you know, how I cover these guys as a journalist. But always was crazy about him. Um, always really respected everything he dealt with. I think w- I think he saved the sport in 2001. And so we knew each other, and we had, we had obviously I'd written features about him and, and interviewed him a million times, but we became friends during the process of the book. And um, and I mean, just the, the 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 gift 
of sitting in his house and in his office. So I would go up to the house, and he would pick another. He pick a, a different spot every single time on the property. Hmm. Like we'd be in the tree house one time, or we'd go to Old West Town the next time, or we'd be in his office, or we just get in one of his cars and drive around, or we'd go over to the shop where he was working on some old truck or whatever, and we would do. We would have these conversations, and what we realized very quickly was we could really only do one a week because it was so intense. And it was all pretty raw. I mean, this is 2018. I mean, this is not, you know, he had just retired. And so when he was going back through those things and vocalizing a lot of it and remembering a lot of it for the first time, um, it took a lot out of him. And so for him to share those things with me and to trust me with it, and Amy, I mean, I, the, conversations, the conversations I had with Amy, I remember one in particular, the three of us were just sitting in the den. And it was us and the dogs. And there wasn't a baby yet. And and I, I will. I remember consciously thinking during that conversation, I cannot believe, and I am so thankful that they trust me with this. And so that was that was a gig I took very seriously. But but the, the ultimate payoff is we're friends. He's he, what Dale is. He's the friend that we talk. We've had this conversation. You don't see him as much as you want to. You don't talk as much. As you want. I'm very conscious about not bothering him because he's busy, and I think he does the same for me. But when we get together, it's great. You know. Mm-hmm. In fact, the way I just said that sounds like Dale, right? Yeah. It's great. It's you great, know, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> So Marty, we just had him on Marty McGee when we were in Daytona, and Marty and I have joked ever since that Dale's that guy that when you spend a little time with him, you start talking like him, like your British friend. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're hanging around with Dale, everything's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. You know, and so ever since we, we – Marty and I had this conversation on the show Saturday. Ever <laughs> since we had Dale and Marty McGee from Daytona, we feel like we both have said the word awesome more awesome. than we yep. did before. Man, that's awesome. Do you know what it is for me? It's, hey, man. That's me, too. Hey, man. As yeah. soon as I started producing yeah. this show. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. Hey, man. Well, what I love about Dale is he, when he gets fired up, he does this thing where he, he'll, he'll punch a word at the end of a sentence yeah, to yeah, make yeah. his point. He goes, right? You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and it, but, but, it, but, but it just tells you that he's genuinely excited. When he's not doing that, that's when you're like, all right, he's ready to go. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But, but, it's, uh, but, but, but what a gift. And, and like I say, what, what he said in that press conference meant a lot to me because um, we, we did become great friends. And I just – I will forever be thankful that they trusted me with, uh, with that book. And, I'm, and, and that book still helps people. I mean, I mean just within the last few weeks – um, a friend of mine had a family member that was struggling with concussion and, and it had been this protocol for two years and it, it was very similar to what we write in the book where you know their local doctor just isn't equipped to handle it and they're mm-hmm. doing their best but they don't know and I called Dale and I was like dude I need Mickey's number and Mickey Collins was the doctor that helped Dale in Pittsburgh and 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 the 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 book's been out almost six years and not a week goes by that I don't hear from someone wow who said you know we read this and we got an appointment or we read this and we did this and 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 just it's changed people's approaches to you know how they attack a head injury or a concussion and 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 if i'm hearing from people once a week or once a month dale's getting it all the time and so that's that's why that that book is the gift that keeps on giving right that's really neat yeah that's cool and again i just i still can't believe that they uh that they let me do that but yeah but it's but it's it's uh and that's why and and honestly I can't believe they called asking for help with the book, and I can't believe they called me to come in here with you guys today. Hey, we wouldn't want anyone else. Yeah. Definitely. Hey, and you've spent some time with Dale Senior yeah. as well. Yeah. It's funny, at Daytona every year now, I do this thing so that we, that we, with a late friend, Marcy Scott, who Marcy was, uh, her name is over the, the door at the media center at Atlanta Motor Speedway. We lost Marcy to cancer several years ago, but Marcy and I were having a conversation. Um, I probably... I mean, it would have been seven, eight years ago. We're standing in the back of the media center at Daytona the morning of the race. And, you know, like John Cena or Chris <laughs> Evans or, you know, right. so, you know somebody, uh, Charlize Theron, somebody's doing their press conference like they do in the morning on, on race day. And she leaned over to me and she goes, how many people in this room, because it's packed, how many people in this room were ever just in the room with Dale Earnhardt Sr.? And, you know, and every year you go back to Daytona, this is my 29th Speed Weeks, uh, you know, or last month, early this month. And, and every time you go out, there's fewer people that you know were in the room. I'm not talking about being friends with him, um, but just knew him a little bit or were just in the room with him. And the number gets smaller and smaller every year. But, yeah, it drove me a little crazy when, when Dale passed in 2001, how many people came out and said, oh, yeah, well, he and I went fishing one time. No, you didn't. I mean, everybody, all of a sudden, everybody's your best friend. Oh, well, it happens now. People pass away. Chris Mortensen, my longtime colleague, these people pass I was like, oh, I remember I did. No, you didn't. I, I, I was with him all the time. I never saw you. you know? And so mm-hmm. a lot of people claim to have been closer to Dale Sr. than they actually were. 
Um, but I was around him a lot, and uh, and, and he, he knew my name. I know that. That was cool. I didn't yeah. know I didn't know that he knew my name. But he was the, – the ultimate compliment from Dale Sr. was if he gave you a hard time. And there, were, there was two times he did it to me. We did um, – I was in the garage back in the day of the 90s, right? Everybody's testing at the racetrack all the time. Right. And, I mean, I mean, and so I worked on a show called RPM Tonight. It was a nightly motorsports show on ESPN2, and I was a producer, field producer. And every week, oh, they're testing at Darlington. They're testing at Martinsville. They're testing it. We would get in the car, drive over there and do it. And we go to Charlotte, and there's like three cars testing. It's like Dale and like Bill Elliott and like Greg Sachs or somebody, you know. Mm-hmm. And I had a date that night, and I had no idea – that I was going to be going to the racetrack. And so I was dressed for the date. I was going to go on the date right after. <laughs> so I've got on like Abercrombie, mm-hmm. you know, I got on a blue shirt and I got on like Dockers, you know, I got on khakis. I'm, dry, I'm, I'm ready to go. Bucks, I'm ready to go. It's the 90s. <laughs> and uh, I go to the racetrack and Dale, because pulling the racetrack and pulls in the garage stall, we're just, I'm just standing there, we're shooting footage, whatever. And when the net comes down and the crew's messing around, Doug goes, hey, I looked at him. He said, uh, "You dressed a little damn preppy for the racetrack." <laughs> I go, "Yeah, yeah. I got a date tonight." He goes, "All right." And he said, "Do you need to talk to me?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, well, "We're going one more run. We'll come back. We'll talk." Great. Next one, of the run comes in. He gets out. And he goes, uh, "All right. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. I'll come back. And we'll knock this out." I go, "Okay." And when he comes back, he grabbed my shoulders and he squeezed the back of your neck, you know. And he took his hand. He smacked me right in the center of the back. Oh, my man's got a date. Got a date tonight. Hot date. All right. Well, get this. Get you out of here. Great. And what I didn't know was he had put his fingers in some sort of <gasps> bear grease, something, you know, and just put handprints on my back and like all oh, so the reason he kept smacking me and stuff. And so I, I, <laughs> the interview's done. I go walk through the garage and like Bill Elliott's crew's like laughing. I'm like, tell the everybody. Why is everybody laughing at me? And I get in the truck and I'm like, and I and I got, I remember I stopped to get gas or something, and there's something on the seat of my truck. I was like, what is this? <laughs> and I realized, so I take my shirt off like in the parking lot of the gas station, and I got Dale Earnhardt's handprints on the back of oh my thing. My God. He put like a sticker back there, oh, like a Moog awesome. chassis parts or whatever. <laughs> and so, you know, it, that was a typical Dale Earnhardt prank because it was funny, but it wasn't funny. Right. You know, and so now I got to go back to my apartment and I got to change clothes. And I'm an idiot. I threw the shirt away. It, oh, it, it, it was ruined. Yeah. But how amazing would it be oh, yeah. if you had to have you this shirt? It. I, I have to have, should have that frame. Yeah. And but Dale Earnhardt's handprints were on it. So yeah, there was that. And then there was one time, uh, in so at the 1999, the end of the 20th century, ESPN did this big, broad, sweeping project that kind of was, was the granddaddy of 30 for 30 and all that. Mm. And it's called Sports Century. And they, they um, went and polled all these sports writers, broadcasters, whatever, and came up with the list of the top 100 athletes of the 20th century. And they did documentaries on the top 50. Um, and, you know, it's Michael Jordan and Babe Ruth, and, and, you know, you can imagine. Almost no race car drivers on the list. And they were all in, like, the 90s. And it was like AJ, Mario, Richard Petty, that was it. They're like 92, 95, whatever. So I decide, working on RPM tonight, we're going to do – the top 10 drivers of the 20th century. And mm-hmm. I'm going to do features on it. And I polled a bunch of writers and they came up with a list. And we set up, sit down interviews. All the guys were alive. We set up, set up interviews with everyone. We go up to DEI, which is brand new. This was with 1999. And it's the Garage Mahal and all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, Dale's agreed to do an interview. And they set us up in the executive, like, lunch room like this really really nice dining hall and there's an executive chef and all that stuff and so dale we're getting set up we get there an hour and a half early and we're getting set up all of a sudden the door flies open and doug goes what the hell are y'all doing we're getting ready for the interview he's we got to go get set up it's time to get on with this thing and i'm like dale we've got we got like an hour and a half. No, you don't. You got five minutes. I'll be back in five minutes. Y'all better be ready. Slams the door. Oh my god! And we don't even. So now we're hauling gear and sandbags and hanging lights and all this stuff. And this is the '90s, right? So y'all got these fancy LED lights. These are like old school, like <laughs> hot as hell, yeah. like like you know <laughs> theater like lights. radiate. Yeah, yeah. They weigh five hundred pounds. So we're setting up all this stuff. As me, I remember uh, the, the photographer was Chuck Lampy, and I can't remember who the third guy was. And we're scrambling, and we get it all set up. And and in the middle of it, he opens the door again. Y'all ready? Damn it, it's time to be ready. And slams the door shut again. So we get it ready, and I'm sweating and everything. And then he comes in, and he goes, well, good job, y'all. He goes, now let's eat. Oh, my And they bring in lunch. (laughs) And so we all sat there and had lunch. 
And I am rattled. And now he's like, man, eat this escargot. This is great. You know, I'm like, all right. All right. And, and so he completely messed yeah. with us. So then we do the interview. And uh, uh, what the, the, anniversary, the 20th anniversary of his death in 2001, we did a big series, a big 30 for 30 documentary, or excuse me, E60 documentary for ESPN. And I told the producers, go find this interview. Because in my mind, it was the greatest interview of all time. We did, I wasn't a reporter. I was a field producer. And they found the interview like in the back corners of the library at ESPN. So I only have a clip, and if you, and the voice you hear in the background that sounds like a scared twelve-year-old, that's like twenty-nine-year-old me, <laughs> not even twenty-nine, like twenty-six-year-old me, and I'm completely rattled and nervous to be talking to Dale Earnhardt. Is that one of the things that, that, that a lot of guys sometimes in their career they say, "Man, I really would like to run against Richard Petty when he was at his best," or "I would like to run against Jeff Gordon." Kind of, you, you hit all that. I've, I've been, fortunately, I was able to race with Kel Yarbrough and Richard Petty and David Pearson and and then Daryl Waltrip and all these guys and then here goes Rusty Wallace and, and uh, now Gordon and uh, I, I've you know been fortunate been been around a while maybe I've been around too long but uh, I've got I still feel like we got some years to be around and hopefully we can be racing Dale Jr. some of these other guys for a championship. And, and so. The, the interview, in my mind, the interview was like an hour long, and it was epic. And, that, and the, the, you, what you saw is about half the interview. Like, the thing was about was about 12 minutes long. And toward the end of the interview, you see his eyes moving around. He's looking for J.R. Rhodes, his longtime PR guy, like, it's time to get out of here. Mm -hmm. But he was so good to me, and we talked I mean, We talked after that. But but a story I've, 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 I've told him told the story a couple of times, but I, I always think about him when it comes to Las Vegas because the first Las Vegas race, um, which was this same year, in 99, um, I wasn't there. And the reason I wasn't there, and back then I was doing 25 races a year. I wasn't there. My mother passed away very unexpectedly uh, at the end of February. And I was supposed to go to Vegas next week, and I wasn't there. And I was gone for about a month. And I was – you guys know this. When you travel every weekend, it's not a big group. It's only a few hundred people. And so you, you know when someone's not there. And I, I, knew, I, I knew Dale knew my face because I was there every week. But I, you know, I, there wasn't any way he knew my name. I wasn't again. My job was to was to get Matt Yoakum and Bill Weber and John Kernan and these guys, Jerry Punch and these guys, set them up. I was a producer. Mm. But I remember I finally came back to the racetrack and it was at Darlington, and I was coming out of the bathroom. Y'all know they got that old locker room bathroom thing at that old garage in Darlington. I was coming out of the bathroom and Dale walked past me. It's the middle of happy hour, and he walks past me and and I walk past him and he just kind of nodded at me. All of a sudden he goes, Ryan. It's the only time I heard him say my name. And I turned around, and he goes – he walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder. He goes, I heard about you, Mom. He goes, I'm so sorry. And now I'm trying not to cry, mm -hmm. you know, in front of the intimidator. And he goes, I need to tell you something. He goes, everybody's going to tell you that you're going to get over this one day. He goes, you are never going to get over this. He said, my dad died, you know, 25 years ago, whatever it was. And he goes, you never get over it. You just learn how to live with it. And he goes, and you just do what you can to make her proud. And I'm like, thank you. And he turned, went in the bathroom, and I just, I mean, <sighs> fell apart. And then going back to the fact that I wasn't really close with Dale Jr. when his father passed away, sometime in the spring of 2001, I stopped Dale Jr. and told him that story. And he didn't know me. You know, we knew each other a little bit at the racetrack, and I know he didn't remember it because you just, if you ever lost a parent, you just walk around in a fog, you know, and especially everything that Dale Jr. was dealing with. So it was, um, I, and I, I, I I had a friend lost a parent just last week. I'm at that age now where that's happening a lot. And I recount that story from Dale Sr. all the time. I don't say, well, Dale Earnhardt told me because that's just right. – that, that, but, but, I, but I say best advice I ever received from anyone after the death of my mother was that. And so mm -hmm. I always think about that when it comes to Vegas because Vegas was the next race after mom passed. And so, uh, so yeah, it was uh, – that was my Dale Earnhardt. So, so I got I got I got Dale Earnhardt giving me a hard time moments, and then I got I got literally the greatest advice I ever received when it wow. came to grief. And and then and then who knew that two years later, you know, I'd be, we all be falling back on that same advice because we lost him. Hmm. So there you go. That's literally all the stories I have. Like again, all these people that tell these stories. Oh yeah, Dale and I used to go hunting together, <laughs> right. and children should go. That hey, damn guy never went hunting with us. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden everybody starts claiming they were friends. But those are my Dale Senior stories. I'll say from that clip, you didn't sound nervous. Yeah, you sounded more well fed. Yeah, and I and I sounded like uh, it's funny. People, the weirdest thing about doing Marty and McGee is that people accuse us of having fake accents. 
It's the, it's the weirdest phenomenon. The first thing is them telling you how to dress. I can't believe you wore that tie. <laughs> you need a haircut. Mm-hmm. I'm like, really? But then the other part is people thinking that Marty and I are faking our accents. And then you hear me then. I'm like, hey, Dale. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm so from Rockingham, man. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Dale, did you – did you like run, racing against Kelly Yarbrough? That's what that's what it's selling. So so it's so yeah. You think I, when I when I when I moved to Bristol, Connecticut, and I sounded like that, they were all like, "We don't understand anything you're saying." I'm like, "Yeah." That's what got me my break at ESPN was I could interpret, I could play interpreter for when they would feed in interviews with Bill Elliott. Dang. I, I remember I remember because everybody I was the only Southern at ESPN in the mid '90s when I first started out of college, and I remember. Uh, these all these guys, all, all these northeastern corridor, you know, guys all went to Cornell and they're, you know, they got five hundred vowels in their last name. They, they, you think they can understand what the hell Bill mm-hmm. Elliott was talking about? Right. And so I remember, I remember clearly about a guy named Matt Sanduli, legendary ESPN guy. And Matty says, "Where's the Southern guy? Don't we have a Southern guy?" I'm like, "Yeah, he's coming here. I don't know what the hell this guy's talking about." That's it. And he had play and Bill Elliott's like, "Well, we have a dial with the situation." <laughs> and I'm like, well, "All right." He said, "It's the deal of a situation." And what he means is, so I was like a UN interpreter, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that was my break for at ESPN. It got me, got me moved back to North Carolina within you know, two years. So That's there you go. so awesome. Yeah. Man. So yeah. So, so yeah. Dale. Dale, what was it like when you raced against Richard <laughs> Petty, Dale? Was that awesome? Yeah. You yeah. sound like a family guy character when you yeah. that Yeah. No, no, it sounded like one there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's so funny when you go back and listen to it. But Marty and I, Marty and I all the time, we uh, we go find old pictures. If you ever Google Marty Smith and Dale Earnhardt Jr., you get two pictures. You get the famous moment of them drinking the beers together, which mm-hmm. they talked about on the show a couple weeks ago uh, after the Homestead race. And then the other one is Frosted Tips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, peroxide Marty and Dale Jr. and that, that, but they all had Casey Kane. All those dudes had. I didn't. I never did frosted tips. Y'all could probably tell, never pull that off. <laughs> but we have people in the room remember that every race car driver thought frosted tips was the way to go, and it worked for him at the time. Should we bring it back? No, never. Not a chance. It, it'll come back though. My daughter's buying Next vinyl week. records, and I love vinyl. I records. know. I know. That's that's all. The, 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 everything. Everything comes back. I was in a uh, Urban Outfitters with my daughter over the holidays, and they're selling damn cassette tapes. Oh, so it's like everything. Dang. Everything comes back. Yep. The the nineties, I could make so much money now <laughs> if I had just saved all the Chase Authentics, right? Oh, mm. I mean, I had I mean, boxes. Yeah, I mean, the jacket I'm wearing now, I'm wearing a Star Wars. This is a pod racing jacket. I love that jacket. Thank by you. The way. But it looks like a nineties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had. I mean, I had boxes of that stuff and just hauled it down to Goodwill. My daughter's so mad at me. Oh yeah, because. You know, she would allow. I was in a I was in a store at the mall, and they were selling a Mike Skinner Lowe's racing shirt for seventy five dollars. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm a. Uh, I mean, Mike Skinner. I love Mike, but I mean, I think even Mike would be like, really. That's yeah. like that's like someone in twenty years walking around with like an AJ Allmendinger no, no. jacket. <laughs> no, no, no. So I'm at that age now, right? I'm, so we're gonna talk. We're, and by the way, we are actually no gonna talk about racing. Allmendinger. But but we're but you know. I'm old enough. I remember the day John Hunter Nunchuk was born. Oh. I remember the first time I saw Chase Elliott, he was about three or four months old, and his father was carrying him down pit lane on the morning of the Daytona 500. So I'm at that point now. Mm. So, yeah, so the retro stuff is hilarious to me because I'm, I've come completely full circle Check this on out. all that stuff. Look at Look this guy. guy. Oh, hey. oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> is he rolling a tire? What's he, he doing right there? Rolling a Goodyear He's tire. Sexily rolling a tire <laughs> through the garage. Look at the collar on this oh, yeah. shirt. Can you see that? Oh yeah. Holy cow, yeah. man! I know, no, dude. It was it was one, one of the greatest things that NASCAR chasm does is he'll dig out those old headshots. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a sucker for all these retro social media accounts, NASCAR social media. And, and when they dig out the, there was the one year where NASCAR I, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I worked at now I worked at NASCAR. Uh, I worked at NASCAR productions back then it would call it nascar images for a couple of years and i remember we'd do the headshots you know we bring the guys in and shoot all this video and we'd have the person in there with the thing spraying their faces to make them look sweaty <laughs> and and then shoot them like a almost like a uh almost like a it's like okay. a fisheye lens so their noses look huge and they look all sweaty i'm like what are we doing to these guys <laughs> but at the time that was you know that was what you did that was cool back yeah, then. yeah if you took as a field producer if you took a tripod into the field you get fired because the whole idea was keep it loose, man. You right. know, we're gonna shake you. Know, oh edging. yeah, it's MTV, baby. <laughs> oh yeah. So it's <laughs> and when it when it worked, it was great, but it didn't work very often. Dang, how much for me to show up next week with frosted tips on this show, dude? Do it. Yeah, you should. You need Bring to show. Yeah, no, you Just show with frosted bit. tips and like a like a like a like a, a genuine 
Dale Jr. like nineteen, like got the outlaw on mm-hmm. it. You know, one of those. You need, you need yep. to, yeah, you need to just roll in with that stuff. A hundred percent. All right. Yeah. You see, and you're the age again. I've known you for a really long time. How old were you when I first met you? Probably like twelve. Yeah. And so uh, come to the racetrack, and it was awesome. And uh, just saw your dad at Daytona. And the uh, but 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 you know you're the age now. I tell these stories. So <laughs> my my uh, and I promise y'all we're gonna talk about the races in a minute. <laughs> I, my mentor was Tom Higgins, uh, in my opinion, the greatest NASCAR beat writer that ever lived. Uh, charter member of the NASCAR Hall of Fame with the Squire Hall Award. He was one of the very next year. Um, but Pap, I would wear him. I would come right. He lived right over here, and we would do a show, do a feature called the Rearview Mirror for RPM tonight. And it was just basically him telling these awesome stories. He had a uh, most ridiculous Dale Earnhardt. He actually went fishing when hunting with Dale Earnhardt Sr. Um, but but Higgins, I would wear him out all the time. We'd go to lunch after we'd shoot this stuff at his apartment. And uh, I would ask him about Fireball Roberts and Curtis Turner and, you know, all these guys. Well, then, you know, maybe 10 years ago when Kelly Crandall and Matt Weaver and, you know, the uh, Bianchi, these really talented young writers were, all, were, were coming into the media center, I took a bunch of them to, to dinner one night in Birmingham, the way that Tom Higgins and Steve Wade and Bob Moore and those guys took care of me, you know, when I first started showing up at the racetrack. And I think we're going to, then I think we're going to talk about like interviewing style and writing style and, you know, all you know, about the business. No, they want to talk about uh, what was Ward Burton like, you know, mm-hmm. what was Sterling Marlin like, you know, what was it like covering races at South Boston? I'm like, damn it, really? I remember I called Higgins and I go, "Is this how it was for you?" All he was, "Yes." So, <laughs> so I'm at that point in my career now where you know, I got people asking me and you know buying retro stuff and yeah. talking about frosted tips like they're talking about you know, yeah. old World War II footage. <laughs> I'm like, it happened like five minutes ago. Yeah, wasn't it around the same time as World War II? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, and it, but then you go back to YouTube and you look at the races that I covered, and it's standard definition square one by one video and you're like damn it it's just, it's just <laughs> it's that much oh, it'll yeah, happen to y'all if you're fortunate enough to hang around as long as a lot of us have it'll happen to y'all too mm-hmm. yeah but I, I, so i guess i guess we should talk about the actual races right yeah. i think yeah is that we what we do into it. okay i mean you know story dirty time air. story time with mcgee you want to get on with uh with dirty air brought to you by tire pros mm-hmm all right, so there was a race. There were three great, great races over the weekend um, at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. By the way, a little windy on Saturday. Did you see that? Yeah. Oh, my God. I thought yeah. that the the poor the, – the, there are certain protocols. You're like, all right, we're not going to do this or we are going to do that. You know, Disneyland has the big fireworks show at the end of every night, but a lot of nights it gets canceled because of, of the wind because, mm-hmm. you know, it's basically sitting in the desert. I was surprised that Las Vegas did not have a protocol for the poor people carrying these flags. Mm. They had these flags that walked out there. Again, I got on with a pod racing jacket. If you see Phantom Menace, they walk out before the race and they're holding up the flags for each team. Order, and they had this whole flag thing oh, out I there. Oh, I missed that. Oh, my God. And I was like, I was like, these poor people trying to hold old glory are going to be <laughs> launched into the, out into the desert. I don't know how they did it. But it was, uh, it, was just, I would, it was as windy as I can remember seeing it at the racetrack. And the drivers talked about, the cup drivers even on practice on Saturday trying to catch, you the know, wind. trying to catch the wind. Mm-hmm. And so, so yes, it was very windy. But three great races. Um, I mean, certainly three um, different outcomes. I guess, you know what, let's we'll, we'll start Friday and work away. So, Roger Carruth is an amazing story. Yeah. And the history of what he accomplished. I mean, only the third black driver to win it in a NASCAR National Series ever. Right. You know, Wendell Scott, Bubba Wallace. And now Raja. And, but that dude's still in college. The funniest thing was him in his post-race press conference basically lobbying his professors. He goes to Winston-Salem State just up the road. Uh, you know, lobbying his professors, hey, I'm a little busy this weekend. Can I get an extension because, you know, I got homework this weekend. I love that. Yeah, and I, get, I need to ask him if he did. But that guy, that's the nicest dude, and he loves NASCAR. Jamie Little, our friend over at Fox, posted the most amazing picture, I think it was on Saturday, of her and Roger Carruth, I believe it was at Richmond, and he was just a teenager at the racetrack with a, with a press pass, with an infield pass, not even a press pass, and had a Bubba Wallace shirt on, and had his, you know, had his red can headphones on, going to listen to the scanners and all that stuff, and took a picture with Jamie Little, but that's who that dude is, and he's just, he is, he is so focused I had a great conversation with him for just a very few minutes 
on Thursday night at Daytona. He was walking off the grid as I was walking out for the duels, um, or whatever we're calling them now. And uh, <laughs> and, and it was it was uh, and I had a great conversation. But I just I like him a lot. Yes. Um, and so for him to do that was it's it, not not just historic, but that is fine. That's a win that a lot of people have expected for a while. And now I think you guys know once you get that first one. Oh man! You usually start getting them pretty quick. What kind of potential do you think he has for the rest of this year? Then, I think he has a lot of potential. Um, you know, it, it's uh, and it's not just about what he w- did at Vegas, but it was about what we saw from him in the races leading up to that. And so, you know, it's he's with a good group mm-hmm. that loves young race car drivers. Inspire. He's um, got backing. Obviously, I mean, you saw his sponsors. You know, had the Hendrick Car sponsorship. Um, you know, and so I, I think the potential's through the roof. Um, you know, the, the question is, how do you handle it? Mm. And um, and there are guys that, um, I mean, I know, I know Denny, uh, Denny drops his podcast, you know, today as well. But yesterday, I, uh, yesterday. But I, I remember, I remember uh, having this conversation with Denny. He had won the Bud Shootout, and then he won one points race that was at Poconos his rookie year, essentially his rookie year. Technically, it wasn't, but he was, and he made the chase. And we did a story for ESPN the magazine where um, we are. The guy who wasn't invited to go to Good Morning America and to go to the Tonight Show because Gordon and Johnson and Stewart and those guys were flying all over the country. And Denny, literally, I was with him for three days. He went to Great Clips, got a haircut. Uh, he went uh, went and bought Madden because he had Madden on hold <laughs> at the GameStop, you know. And uh, he was in the process of buying a house, the house that you know um, that he made famous and infamous all at the same time. But he and I had a conversation. He spent a lot of money that week, bought a new plane. Uh, bought a you know three million dollar house next to Joe Gibbs, all this stuff. Haircuts are expensive these yeah, days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mad- and Madden on hold, right? <laughs> I can't afford that. But he and I had a conversation that very week, and I wrote it in the story about you know. All right, so what do you do now? You only really only won one race, so every guy that stands at that crossroads of how do you handle that going forward? And I remember when Denny won. I think it was his second Daytona 500. I was in Victory Lane for Sports Center, and Denny, this is I mean this is 15 years later where Denny grabbed me as well. What happened? <laughs> How did I handle that first one? I go pretty good, yeah. You know, and so I don't worry about a guy like Roger because because he's mature beyond his years. Uh, there are guys I worry about. Can they handle this? Um, but but he's not one of those guys. He's such a workhorse. I'm, yep. I met him I think in Dover 2018 for the first time, yep. and he he was that guy handing business cards yep. out. Yep. Just you know connecting as much as he could. It's uh, it's cool to see that. He said yesterday on uh, Door Bumper Clear too that you just got to do the work, you yep. know, and yep. that's it. Good things come to people who do the work. Yep. Who do you worry about in terms of handling the pressure? You said Raj is not one of those guys. No, I, you know, that- it's it, it's it's um, it's an interesting time for me because I have to work really hard to get to know these guys. I used to know mm. them all coming up. You know, I mean, like Dale Junior. I, I I I I watched Dale Junior. and Kelly race at Myrtle Beach. So there were guys that I knew. I knew who Jimmy Johnson was because we used to, you know, run truck his his stadium truck highlights right. on RPM Tonight back in the day. So there are I don't know the kids in the truck series like I used to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, and I and even if I did, I wouldn't say, well, I damn, damn guy can't do it, you know. But what I just worry about is maturity. Mm-hmm. You know, I worry about, um, you know, when you and we saw this unfortunately in a lot of awful ways. When the young guns craze happened, and a lot of guys were pushed into rise that they quite frankly weren't ready for yet. You know, Joel Logano will tell you he he suffered because he got pushed up the chain too fast. It's no different than taking a pitcher uh, or a running back and or quarterback. And we, we're seeing it in Charlotte. I think Bryce Young is an amazing athlete. Now everybody thinks he can't play football, right? And and I, he's one of the best quarterbacks I ever covered. I voted for him for the Heisman. And um, so how do you handle that? And so that's what I worry about. And we saw this with the Young Guns crash where guys were pushed. Kenny Irwin was pushed into a cup ride way too soon because everyone was looking for the next Jeff Gordon. And then at the next level, we saw guys start doing drugs because all of a sudden they had money and they had time on their hands and they might have won a race or even just won a pole and their careers washed out. I mean, I go over that list all day. And so the the question is how much – and I think – Overall, I think because of social media, because of the world that, I mean, you guys have grown up in and the stuff that you've been forced to compartmentalize um, from the pandemic all the way to Sandy Hook, 
Um, I think that there's a maturity level that exists with kids that are in their 20s today that didn't exist when I was coming along because of what, what they've had to deal with. I, I spoke at graduation at my alma mater, University of Tennessee, back in May, and that was a speech I gave, which is y'all are way smarter than anyone wants to give you credit for. And the reason is because you have dealt with more than any generation's ever had to deal with mentally. And so I think guys are built – I think race car drivers are built to handle those things better now than they were. Um, so I don't worry about it as much as I used to, but I certainly don't worry about Roger Cruz. And then the second race, uh, and again, going back to guys that I remember when they were born, John Henry and Ewchek. All right, here's, so here's a bar bet. We, we were talking about this before we started recording. <laughs> here's a bar bet that you would win all day long, even with someone who considers himself a hardcore NASCAR fan, is – how many Xfinity wins does John Hunter Nemechek have now? He has 10. He won seven last year. Right. That right there, there's, there, there is not – I don't care if you found the most hardcore, old-school, sandwich construction company, NASCAR cafe, like, you know, NASCAR theme deal. If you walked into the bar and everybody's sitting there wearing their NASCAR gear and you went, how many Xfinity races did John Hunter Nemechek win last year? No one's saying seven. Yeah. No one. And, 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 I, and I like that about him. Because he's just – and I love the fact that he's successful in that series because his father loves, loved the Bush Nationwide Xfinity Series more than anyone. Joe, Joe Nemechek, even when he was driving for Felix Sabatis and Hendrick and everyone else, he never stopped racing with his team in the Bush Series. If you, if you were in the NASCAR media in the 2000s, in the 90s, you, you have a picture of yourself, and I do, interviewing Joe Nemechek after the race, after he finished fourth or whatever, <laughs> and his mom would take the picture, and then his mom would print it out and would get him to sign it. Dear Ryan, thank you for your coverage. Joe Nemechek, and you would come in the mail. About two, we all have one of those. Some people have 40 of them. <laughs> and so he, Joe always loved the Bush Series so much. And for folks that don't know, John Hunter is named for John Nemechek. Joe, John was Joe's little brother. John uh, was killed. Uh, people forget this, but John was killed uh, in a truck series crash. I think it was a test session at Homestead, the old Homestead, which was a mile and a half Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It was flat and it was a rectangle. It was stupid. Like mm. the layout was dumb. Mm. And 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 this was before Hans, before Safer, before I right, think. right. And uh, and it was kind of at the beginning of that awful four year period where mm. we were just people. I felt like I was covering funerals monthly, but but John. Hunter was born shortly after that and was named for uh, his uncle that he never met. And so every time John wins, I think those of us of a certain age just feel – it just feels even better, you know, because it's just a great story. But he's really, really talented. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Jimmy Johnson sees something in him. So it's – is there, there there's, there's talent there. But, yeah, no way in the world that you <laughs> walk into even the most hardcore NASCAR bar and you go – John Hunter Nemechek won seven Xfinity races. Not a chance. They'll be like, nope, no way. Yeah. And he won a lot in the truck series, too. Oh, That's yeah. I'm counting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. How many did he get? All right, take a guess. How many truck series wins? I don't know. See, I just I just, I literally 13. just said so this is This is the bar bet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, Dalton. Did I get it right on yeah, the number? Yeah, right on the number. <laughs> he won 13 truck races. Okay. So, John Hunter Nemechek has 23 races, national, national series wins yeah. right now. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's, That's pretty a, good. That's 13. a lot more than others. Yep. Yep. And, and it goes back to, I mean, the room we're sitting in, right, is there is no question that you are given opportunities within racing because it is a family business because of your name. But there's also different tiers of that, right? Um, you know, being Joe Nemechek's son is some notoriety. Right. But that isn't going to get millions of dollars of checks worth written. And I always go back to the conversation I had with Austin Dillon when he was just getting into that three car – and had it with him again after he won the Daytona 500, which is, there is no, he said, there's no question I'm where I am because of my grandfather and because of my dad. Um, but he said, they're not in the car with me. And my last name isn't driving the car. And my, my blood isn't driving the car. He said, you know, and we're standing in the victory lane at the Daytona 500. So it's what do you do with it? And, and I love watching John Hunter because I, it feels a lot like his dad. Like he's grinding. Right. Like he doesn't know how else to do it. And, and that's what that that's so so there are a lot of guys I'm mean, actually again I go through another other list of guys with last names that you know that we were all sold on he's going to be the guy and um and really nice guys and talented guys but it just didn't work out and mm -hmm. so so to watch John Hunter win like he's winning all right talking about guys with potential 
and going to be the next big thing. Um, I have managed to not talk about Kyle Larson now for, for like a half hour. Do you think he has potential? I think he has potential. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, this guy – so there aren't a lot of guys that come in with more hype than Kyle Larson did. And there's a difference. You know, there's hype because of your last name or there's hype because of the team you're with or there's hype because of whatever. But Kyle Larson was one of those guys that we were all hearing about him when he was 15 years old on the West Coast, you know, running on a dirt track behind his parents' house on the farm, right? And so – and then when he when – he, and when he, he had the great break and signed with Chip Ganassi, um, and that team was good, but it wasn't great. And so the question was always, what would, what would happen if he got into that other car? You know, what would happen if he got in with a Hendrick, if he got in with a Penske, if he got in with whatever? And that question was posed to me by – Kyle Larson and his dad. We did a big story years ago for E60. And at this point, Kyle won just a couple of races, um, but he was already being earmarked as the future of the sport. And the next Jeff Gordon, because of where he came from, and all that, next Tony Stewart and all that. And so we did a big E60 feature. I mean, I, I, it might have been eight or nine years ago now, but not on camera because he, was, he, he wasn't going to be disrespectful, but off camera. Uh, Kyle Larson and Kyle Larson's dad both were like they're just they were in the garage at like Charlotte and they're looking at the Hendrick cars going I just like one race in one of those cars just to <laughs> see just to see if there's a difference and I've asked Kyle that you know when Kyle was running for the championship last year and I asked him toward the end of the year I said alright so you said this to me years ago man if I could just get in one of those cars I go alright now you're in a Hendrick car you know is it what you thought it was going to be and he goes it's better mm. He said, there's just a whole other level to this that I didn't understand. And he goes, and it's not just preparation. It's all. It's not just equipment. It's also mentality. And it's also cycling up to the weekend. It's all these things he said, that you just don't think about. And that's how, you know, you win as many races as they have. So, yes, I think he has potential. He went, <laughs> he went it was 24 Cup Series races now, which in a relatively short time, um, he's won 24 races. He's now 31. 31? Mm-hmm. We said in 30. Your page. Yeah, it's yeah, now, mm-hmm. now 31st uh, alone all time on the all time wins list. He's right behind, or 30, so he's right behind, uh, he's just two wins behind Dale Jr. now, right? Yes. Yeah. Dale had 26. Yep. And two wins behind, and Dale's tied with Fred Lorenzen. Right. And now he's in that group where if he has an average Kyle Larson season, if he wins four or five races, He's in that group now where you start the year ranked 30-whatever on the all-time wins list, and you could end the year ranked 20th. Right. Because he's in that group now where there's a bunch of guys who are all in the Hall of Fame. By the way, he just he just left a tie. He was tied at 23 wins with Ricky Rudd, who should be in the Hall of Fame. And next up is Jim Paschal, who should be in the Hall of Fame. So And, and, and those guys have been nominated multiple times. So I think that um, – I mean, he he's already – I and mean, he he would roller skate in the Hall of Fame if you're retired right now. Oh yeah, and he's 31. He's 31 years old, which is what you were trying to tell me, and I didn't understand it. But yeah, he's 31 years old. That's crazy. He, and, and 31 and just getting going really with the team, right? You know that he'll be driving for until he's ready to retire. Mm-hmm. So to your point there, he's 36 all time in NASCAR wins with 24. Right. If he bumps up 10 spots, that's 10 more wins, and that's where Truex sits at 26 right now. Like he could do right. that this year. Yeah. Could do it this year, easy. Yep, that's crazy. Uh, not easy, but you know what I mean. So, so yeah, if he has two average Kyle Larson years, he'll be there. Yeah. I mean, Mark Martin's sitting at twentieth yeah. with forty wins. Yep, and that's the perspective, and it's the perspective of how difficult it is. Mark Martin's a perfect example because Mark never enjoyed a win. Like Mark Martin, as soon as he got out of the car, drive me crazy. As soon as he get out of the car, and he's won like his you know thirty fifth career win or whatever, and he's convinced that's the last time he's ever going to win. You know, which is what he needed to motivate himself. Um, so it just tells you how hard it is. When Dale Jr. retired, I wrote that column, which was it's very easy to go. He didn't win a championship. But you look at what he did in winning 26 races, and at the time only 20-something drivers had ever done that in the history of the sport. You know, It's so hard to do. It's so hard to win a race. And it's super hard. to. And then you got to back it up. There are a lot of guys who won one race. Right, a lot of guys won one just one race, and then there's a big group of guys who won one two races, and then they were done. And even then, you know, Derek Cope, right, won two cup races, 
and everybody, oh, well, you know, Dale Sr. doesn't cut a tire, and, and he was tricked up at Dover. There's always an excuse if you've won two. If you won 24, then you're just really, really good, right? <laughs> you know? And then when you get to 25 and you get to 30 and you get to 40 and 50 and all that stuff, that's just – it's it's we kind of take it for granted. It's like in baseball, we take home runs for granted, you know? Big, these guys now, especially in the steroid area, these guys hit 600 home runs. And, you know, Dale Murphy at 398. It was really hard, you know, but it's just very easy to retroactively go, oh, pff, that's not that many home runs. Yeah, it is. It's a lot. And so Ricky Rudd was a crazy talented guy and grinded his tail off for 30 years and famously won one race a year for how many years? 16 years in a row, whatever it was. And, uh, and he he didn't win as many as Kyle Larson. Twenty three. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's, it's it's just it's just truly, truly remarkable. And also too, I am the first one to have ripped the Drive for Diversity program, which has been around for twenty years now. But now we're sitting in a year where we had a truck series winner at Daytona came from the program, Kyle Larson came from the program, Roger Cruz came from the program, uh Daniel Suarez came from the program. You know, that's so so credit where credit's due. I, as someone who has banged on that deal for a long time because I just felt like back in – and it was back in the day a publicity stunt. Um, but but for but to now see guys who actually came through the process, like Raja, and and see them win – Daniel, see them winning races, that that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Did Reddick – if we talk about how yeah. good Larson is, yeah. like did Reddick stand a chance trying to track him down? It seemed like Larson was able to – I thought he had him. I mean, I really yeah. did. With two laps to go, I'm like, all right, here we go. Yeah. You know, and, and the way he was, by the way, like Harry Gant riding that wall. That was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. And then, see, I'm, see, I'm doing it now. Hey, man. That was awesome. Yeah. He's riding the wall, man. It was awesome. <laughs> right? But, but, yeah. but, but it's, um, uh, no, I, I thought he had a chance. But also, credit to Kyle Larson. That car was so good. Larry McReynolds had the best line on the post race show. Larry loves to talk about turning points, right? And they asked Larry about the turning point of the race because the turning point of that race is when they loaded that five car on the rig in Concord <laughs> and it rolled out on Tuesday <laughs> yeah. to, to go out there. And, and he's right. And uh, um, but 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 well, that car was so good, but he still had a chance to lose the race. And that car was going away. Yeah. And he still figured out a way. It just that was a master at work. And if you're Tyler Reddick, we're talking about getting headspace, right? If you're Tyler Reddick now, what do you do with this? Because three times now they finished one two. Mm-hmm. And three times Reddick has finished second. Yep. And Tyler is a California guy with all the headlines and all that stuff. And, and, and if, very much to me like Kyle Larson. You know, is he, is he with the team that can get into where he needs to get? All those things. So, yeah, the question is what do you do with that? Is it the motivator for you? Or do you become, and with the greatest respect to a Hall of Famer, Rusty Wallace, who could not get around Dale Earnhardt in his head? He couldn't do it. And so – if you're Tyler Reddick now, are you are you going to be like Harry Gant struck a race, right? Oh, hell, here we go again, right? And run behind him again with three laps to go. You know, this is not awesome, you know. <laughs> but, but but the one finally when he does it, and he will one day, it'll be fine. But I, Tyler is the kind of guy that will turn that into motivation. So I, but but it's uh, but man, that's got to be so frustrating. Mm. And again, it's so hard to win these races when you have a chance and you don't and you and you think you really had a chance and you think you might have made a mistake. Um, or at least you got outsmarted a little bit, then uh, I guarantee you Tyler hadn't slept a whole lot since I got back. And Denny spoke on his podcast earlier this week, and in, in Reddick, uh, after the race, he said, same f- different year, yep. and he was referring to the pit crew. And right. Denny, on Action Detrimental this week, went in-depth on how 2311 had to kind of start their pit crew program from the ground up, and right. obviously there were mistakes that were made yep. during the weekend for Reddick. I'm sure that probably has to be feeding into the frustration. But it, I guess it all ties back together. We're talking about Raj's win. How do you handle it from here? Yep. Same thing goes for Reddick. How do you handle losing again from here? I'm always fascinated by that when a driver calls out to pit crew. Mm-hmm. And they've all done it. I mean, they've all done it. I, there's only a few I can think of that never did it. But they did – maybe not publicly, but they certainly would do it in a team meeting or do it privately or whatever. I know drivers have shown up to practice, you know, Monday morning going, what the hell, you know, same thing every time. So I'm always curious about that because, and Denny Denny has done that a lot, um, which is, you know, calling well, you know, another bad pit stop or another so we get a big, big surprise couldn't get fuel in the car or whatever else, um, and and Tony Stewart used to do it all the time. Guys, guys would do it and to effect, um, and so I'm always curious how the pit crew 
reacts to that. You know, my dad was a college football referee, and it was always good to be anonymous because if you weren't anonymous, then you probably had a call that everyone didn't like or that the question. If you're on a pit crew, you you want to take care of your business, paint the fence, and get out of there. And so when the attention suddenly is on you, you know, how do you handle that? The, the, what's different now is is that these guys are all athletes. I mean, these guys are all almost exclusively college athletes. They've been in pressure pack situations before. They've been motivated by different manners, by coaches, you know, uh, good and bad. And so I'm curious. I'm always fascinated by that, the tact of – Everyone knows what you're talking about, and you just said it on national television and said a bad word, you know, <laughs> and the guys all heard it, you know, and uh, particularly if it's going out over the PA, you know, they're packing your car up and they just heard you say it, dude, you know, and if they didn't, somebody's going to say, hey, man, he just, he just said that about the same, same thing every week. So it's – I'm fascinated by the sports psychology of that. Would you say unwarranted for Redick? No, just no. Hey, listen, in the moment, and this is part frustrated. of – This is one of the great things about the sport is that uh, – if your driver's probably not that great, but it's unvarnished. He been out. How long you been out of that car? Sure. Yeah. First person he talked to. The first person he talked to basically had a microphone TV. and a camera, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so no, that to me that that's why that should never change. You know, we 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 they they fiddled around with the idea of a cool down period at one point for post race, and and I I don't call and complain about stuff, but I man I was raising hell. I was like no because. It's the one thing we have that other sports don't have, which is, you know, like if I cover – I cover the college football playoff national championship every year. And the losing team, um, you know, it, really both teams, there's a cooling off period. Like you, you get to stand outside the locker room and you can, you can literally physically hear and feel the energy like yep, dissipating. Go down. And you're like, oh, I need to get in there, talk to these guys while they're still thinking about it, you know, and uh, and so so and, and it's because I'm spoiled because I'm because I'm used to grabbing guys on pit lane or grabbing guys at the gas pumps back in the day, and you would get a real real answer, um, good or bad for them, but it was you know I'm a sports writer man, it's all good for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not to turn this into like an F1 conversation, yeah, but. Uh, they have that cool down for the podium oh, yeah, yeah. and not that that will really increase much entertainment yeah. right now for F1 yeah. but I yeah. mean should we oh. just get rid of that hey, uh, con- congrats to Max for, for stepping on yeah, the championship seriously. already yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like Copy yeah, face. it's um you know it's funny I, again I'm, oh, I'm wearing a I'm wearing a one oh cool yeah, I'm wearing yeah. my, my uh, Fangio t-shirt but the uh but yeah I'm not a big um I'm not a huge dynasty guy you know I, I, I'm not one that ever believed it was good for baseball for the Yankees to be in the World Series every year. And that's not just because I'm a Red Sox fan. You know, I don't think it's good for football. I, I, I think it's cool to watch the Chiefs win a lot of Super Bowls, but I want them to struggle. Like, mm-hmm. I want them to have to earn it. I want them to look like they're going to lose the game. And I, you know, but, 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 you know, it's, it's the line, you know, you guys are young. You ever watch Bull Durham? If yep. you watch Roadhouse, you watch Bull Durham. Yes. Dalton. Of course. And, uh, but there's that line, which is, you know, strikeouts are fascist and they're boring. And that's how I feel about dynasties a lot of time. And mm. so, yeah, it's stinking up the show. I mean, and and people get spoiled, right? And we've had we've had three really good Cup Series races. You know, we've had an historically great finish. We've had what was good, what was a really good one-two duel, and then we had you know the Daytona 500, which is just always bonkers. That's just how it rolls. Um, so you get a little spoiled, right? Because I mean, even back we talking about back in the day, man, how many races? in the 90s and 2000s that I literally go to sleep in a media center because you're just riding around. You say what you want about stage racing. But I was just riding around. And uh, I, mean, I covered races. I, I, went, I was at a race in Michigan at Dale Jarrett. I'm still mad at him about that race because it was the most boring <laughs> thing I've ever been to. We'll go to Coke 600 and guy, guy would win by, by an entire lap. Mm-hmm. You know, and, I, and I'm talking about not that long ago. And so, yeah, when I, when I watch – some of these F1 races now <laughs> on my network, by the way, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah, and we, we're we're very happy to have them at ESPN, but but it's um and and but it is uh, I mean, I literally we did Marty McGee uh, on Saturday morning. I, by the way, I like the race being on Saturday morning, the, the F1 race. I came back to the house, and the dog and I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. So thanks <laughs> thanks Max for stopping for the nap. <laughs> we appreciate that. But but the cool down period, seriously though, and I feel that way too. Like like I'm very fortunate most years I get to do the interview with the Daytona 500 winner and the Indianapolis 500 winner for Sports Center, and I know the importance of the hat dance right I mean I'm sitting in a room full of sponsored stuff but man it's killing me 
when when uh you know William Byron again, whom I've known since he was a teenager, and he's won the race, and I'm trying to get to him, and every minute that goes by, I'm going I know I'm going to get less emotion out of him. Mm-hmm. And so, so, you know, when we have to wait for 30 minutes and I get it, I, everybody needs to do their deal, but, but I, I'm, you know, it's, I want to get to them because I want to, I'm, first of all, I'm impatient and I want to write my story and do my, get it fed up the line, but I also, I want to catch it as raw as I possibly can. You know, um, when he's been crying and I get in 20 minutes later, he ain't gonna cry again. Right. You know? And so, so I, I just, uh, I, I like to catch the, it's something, our, it's something that this sport has that um that everyone else does not well and i've been in that line waiting for the winner too yeah. and it's oh, yeah. like while you're waiting how do i ask a question that he's not gonna have right asked yep. every single time yeah and that's why you're good at your job because um because that's the most important thing i talk to journalism class all the time in colleges i was talking to a group at Ole miss uh, earlier this week and, and what i told them was i said you have to ask a question that they haven't heard before because if they're in a situation, sometimes you have to ask the obvious question. You won the Daytona 500. How's that feel? But then you have to think about, all right, what's a question I can ask because I did my research? Or what's a question I can ask that, that everyone else, the 40 people that went ahead of me, you know, haven't already asked? Mm-hmm. It's why if you listen to, not to get too inside baseball on on, on uh, media stuff, but if you watch press conferences and I'm in the media center, if I ask a question, it's at the very end. And I also defer to – because I'm only at the racetrack a handful of times a year now. Just like if I'm covering the Ohio State-Michigan State game, I'm only at Ohio State once a year. There are beat writers that are there every week. And, you know, Bob Pockers and Dusty and, and Kelly, they're all out there every single week. So the last thing I'm going to do is get in their way. And so I'm going to let them ask what they need to ask. And when we get to the end, if the question I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask it. You know, and I don't like asking it in the room because now hell, it's live stream, and I wanted my, I wanted for my story. You know, that's mm-hmm. why I get so twitchy in Victory Lane because I want to get my time because nobody else is over there with me. And so yeah, it's um, it's a it's a it's a challenging thing in the time of social media. You know, you used to be able to get a quote and keep it to yourself and put it in your story, and no one would see it till it went out that day or till the story ran on TV later that night. Now, you know. It's been tweeted or X or whatever the hell we're calling it now forty times by the before you get back to the media center, and so yeah, it's an interesting time for 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 content. Definitely. Is there a question that you asked you got an answer for that you remember the most after a race? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, there's. Uh, we all think we know how race car drivers. We we all we, there's a part of a part of all of us that think we could do it right. I've been watching. I've been going to racetrack, getting paid to go to the racetrack for th- almost thirty years, and there's a part of you that thinks you know how to do it. So what I love is when they teach me something I didn't know, and when um, it was at the height of the tandem racing at Daytona, and Jeff Gordon, who had basically pushed Trevor Bain to the win in the Daytona Five Hundred. But Jeff Gordon proceeded to make me feel like a moron. Not it. Not, it wasn't his goal, but but he made me realize I don't really know what the hell these guys do because he started talking about stuff like Joey Logano just got busted for mm. finding ways to control the air sitting in the cockpit, um, and, and and knowing you know the stuff that Dale Earnhardt would talk about with an open face helmet about hearing air pressure changes and feeling it in your nose and feeling it in the back of your throat Damn. and all right now it's time to go and being able to look two turns ahead and and, and feel feel where it's all going to go and hope that you're right but it's the best educated guess you have but Jeff Gordon did that for me the day he pushed that Trevor Bain to the, and, and it was funny because we so we do the scrum right everybody's talking to him and I think back in those days they still they would take the top they take two through five to the gas pumps and so we go to the gas pumps to talk to those guys while the winner was was doing all the victory lane stuff then we'd run a victory lane but back then they wouldn't bring him to the media center. Like it was just it was it was. I don't. I, I think that's the window that happened in. But anyway, I just remember everyone, it all kind of dissipated, and then Jeff just grabbed me and started talking about. I want to explain to you what actually is happening out there. And that was the t- tandem deal. And I think that was the. I think that might have been COT right with mm-hmm. the with the. It was uh, around that time. Yeah. So so it was. But him that that, that those were my favorites. I mean, the all timer was when I went to do. The, it wasn't a race situation. I went to do the story on Aaron Fike, um, just to ask him are you okay? 
and he sat there and confessed to me that he had shot up heroin and got in a race truck. And oh, there aren't a few. There, there are only a couple moments in your career like where it's like low. that. Have you ever seen the movie Spotlight? Um, which is the movie about the the Boston Globe and when they were breaking the story about the you know the horrible stuff with the with the you know um, with the Catholic Church and, and kids and all that. Stuff. And there's a moment in that movie. If I ever meet Rachel Adams, right? Uh, um, you know, from Mean Girls. Right. If I ever meet her, I'm going to ask her who did she talk to because this priest starts accidentally confessing and doesn't realize he's doing it. And the look on her face in that shot where she's taking notes and not losing eye contact and trying to make sure I keep this going, that only happens once or twice in your entire career. And when Aaron sat there across that that table from me and said, and just said it, and I, I stopped down. We need to talk about this for a minute. And uh, and we changed the drug policy. We changed everything because of that story. And so there's only a couple mm-hmm. times in your career where where someone will say something to you and you'll be like, when I was writing the book with Dale, there there were Amy said things to me that I still can't. I mean that that's when I knew all right they trust me, you know. And sitting there on the couch and and saying this is what happened here and this is what happened there and I really believe this and I thought this was over and you know and 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 the things that dale talked to me about again there, there's a level of trust sometimes that's therapy for them and even if they don't know you they're just telling you right because they just need to say it to someone yeah but 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 in those situations that's a trust level you know and so so you don't ever take that for granted should we move to uh ask junior i mean ask mcgee yeah is it ask mcgee is that what we're doing so is that ask, ask junior i like the graphic i like the graphic y'all just built by the way x over just junior. a big x over junior and a little bit of, it was like to cover the book <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr. with, with McGee with Ryan McGee. <laughs> and on this thing it was it was Ask Dale with the X and McGee. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So Ask McGee. I'm a little nervous about this, but we'll uh but we'll roll. Yeah. This uh first question coming from I think it was Twitter. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite Dale Jr. slash Dale Senior story? I know we talked about some Dale Senior stories earlier, so yeah. you'll have to tune into that. So any any good Dale Junior stories that you have that's a favorite? Yeah, so so when uh when Dale, so so after Dale retired, and um, typically Daytona Speed Weeks, I stay in a hotel down toward Orlando because I got to do some work, and Daytona's kind of crazy. But this particular year, I guess it was three years ago, Marty Smith, uh, my co-host with Marty McGee, convinced me to stay at the Streamline Hotel. And <laughs> I'm a NASCAR historian first and foremost, so staying at the Streamline is awesome. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, you know, it's the, it, for folks that don't know, that's the, that's the hotel where NASCAR was founded uh, in 1947, um, and a group of guys sat in a in a in a, a very very smoky, you know, room upstairs, the Ebony Room, and now that's an awesome bar, and there's a rooftop deal, and that place was completely falling apart most of the years I was going to Daytona, and now they did an amazing job of renovating. So Marty and I stay there, and that on paper that sounds like a great idea, but if you're having to work. And I'm on the top floor, and I've got, you know, a cover a country cover band up there, and it's like Barth Grooks or, you know, <laughs> you know or Dooks and Braun, yeah. and they're upstairs playing, like, literally, you know, 12 inches from my head. So I go up there to, like, damn, you know, what, what's going on up here? And there's Dale Jr. And, and Amy, and they're doing a big launch, like a big vodka launch, right? And so I'll never forget, and this is when I – we had just gone through the book together, and I hadn't seen Dale in forever – and in the, all this is going on, everybody wants a piece of Dale. Like, everybody's there. The sponsor people are there, and there's fans there, and all this stuff. And Dale, this is why I love him so much, he grabbed me. He goes, come here, come here, come here, come here. And we walk way down around this corner, like through the crowd and all this stuff, and we go, and we would completely abandon Amy. Like, she's surrounded in this cabana area by all these, you know, hangers on. So he walks me all the way around the corner, over on the back side of this hotel, and he goes, hey, man, he goes, how do you feel about Tim Richmond? <laughs> And I go, what? He goes, how do you feel about Tim Richmond? You know, I've never really had a conversation about Tim Richmond. I go, do you not need to be at this thing? He goes, I'll go back. I'll go. He goes, I've been saying, if I see him again, I'm going to ask him about Tim Richmond. That's what we do, right? The last time I met Dale for breakfast, which has been way too long ago now, I get there and he walks in with a big folder full of stuff that he found in the desk of this former NASCAR official. And he, he like purchased some stuff at an estate sale. And he's opening up all these forms, like registration forms for like races in like 1949 and 1950. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm like, it is awesome. <laughs> but that's why I love Dale because it's like no matter what's going on, uh, I, you know, my wife says all the time, like when, when, um, 
I was able to write a book years ago uh, when, when ESPN was getting back into NASCAR about the greatest moments in the history of NASCAR. And I'm writing about Fireball and I'm writing about Curtis and I'm writing about, you know, uh, Joe Weatherly and these guys. And my wife's like, bless your heart. She goes, you have, been, you have had all this stuff in your head with no nowhere to talk about it or write about it. And, and so Dale Jr. is like my safety valve on that stuff. And I, I hope you feel the same way about me. Like, hey, man. How you feel about Tim Richmond? I, mean, I, I would have never <laughs> expected, but, but that's that's what conversations are like with him, which is why I love it. That's awesome. That is great. We actually, uh, this is a first for Ash Jr. We had a fan send in an audio message. Okay. So All I'm right. gonna I'm gonna play it through my phone here. Okay. You wrote that book with Junior, and I was just wondering <laughs> what was the coolest thing, or most interesting thing, or surprising thing that you learned about him when you wrote the book together. Who was that? Pretty awesome fans. Sounds, he didn't awesome. leave his name. I can't it was all Ralph. On. Yeah, Ralph. Ask yeah, me. Ralph from Mooresville checking in <laughs> on the Ask McGee. No, it's it, we, we talked about it a little bit at the top of the show. There were so many moments. But I'll go back to the first time that he and I like sat down to talk about it. And... And I was... Honestly, I was overwhelmed. We were, we were way behind schedule. I mean, way behind schedule. Because... Um, they came to me – I remember I was at Penn State working on a story about their football coach, James Franklin, and Mike Davis called. And I was pulling into a um, – like a Japanese restaurant because I, I don't know if you all know this about me, like Dell Jr., I love teriyaki. So anywhere I am, I'm finding like a hibachi place, right? So I'm pulling in a hibachi place in, in College Station – or excuse me, in, a, um, um, uh, in Happy Valley, Pennsylvania. And the phone rang, it was Mike Davis, and he goes, we would like to talk to you about maybe helping Dale Jr. with his book. And this would have been like October of 2017. Okay, well, when do they want the book to come out? One year. So just so you all know, that's not how this works. Like when you work, work on a book, you have time, right? So I'm thinking, all right, well, we can start working. Yes, I'm going to do it. Well, let's work through the contracts and all this. Well, it went on and on and on and on. Then Dale Jr. had to go to the Olympics in Korea. Next thing you know, yeah. we're not starting this book until like the end of January. And the manuscript was due – Middle of March. This is not how you write a book. And so I was like, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. I really am not. But he and I finally got to go to lunch once all the papers were signed and, and the public deal was done with our, with our great publisher, uh, Thomas Dunn. So we, we go to uh, a hibachi place uh, down in Mooresville. And I'm my, my brain is just rolling. Like, how I don't know how we're going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to wrap my brain around it. And we sat down, and he goes, all right, we need to talk about process. And I go, we need to talk about what we're going to talk, what we're going to write about mm -hmm. first. And he goes, I got you. And that's when he airdropped these notes to me that I still have. Mm -hmm. and, and and these notes are, if you ever, if you've read Racing to the Finish, then you know these notes were the skeleton of the book, like like to the point that we just quoted the notes. And he, and this this is how his brain works. This is why he's he fascinates me. Is all along while he was suffering. He was putting notes in his phone. And these were breadcrumbs. Like what he's thinking is if something happens to me, I want everybody to know this how is I was what's feeling. Going on. Which is horrifying when you think about it. But um, but he airdropped those notes to me and in an instant. I remember he air, he, goes, he airdropped them to me. He's like, hey, I got to take a phone call. And walked out. And left me by myself for about five minutes. And I swear I think he did it on purpose because I just marinated in that for a minute. And it was like I wasn't worried anymore. And he came back, sat down, and I go, this is the book. He goes, I know it. And uh, and I go, who has seen this before? He goes, you. Dang. And uh, and so that 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 was that was that, that that right there was a moment. I was like, all right, this is this is going to be th this this has the potential to be something special. And so from that moment forward, man, it was it was again I, his his honesty with me. I will forever be thankful for um, as a as a writer and and as this amazing opportunity but just as a friend you know it just i i just couldn't i couldn't believe that, that he opened up like that and it literally started in an instant with an airdrop people in the youtube chat talking about those notes being a surprising thing yep. to be able to read in the book yep. uh we got time for one more question um what's the dynamic like on marty and mcgee do y'all ever get into like you know arguments real arguments with each other all right so marty did the show mm-hmm a couple weeks ago, right? Because um, Marty's in the Netflix show. I tell everyone I was edited out in an interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Marty, it's funny. So Marty, I didn't know Marty was doing the show. And I'm like, I'm, I'm at the house working on whatever and phone rings. 
And Marty goes, hey, man, he said, uh, I just did the download, and uh, he goes, our, our, you know, I talked about us. I'm like, well, what would you say? He goes, well, I just told him about how, you know, when we, we think something's wrong, we can pick up the phone and call each other or whatever. And I told him about that time I called you. I go, okay. And he said, I just wanted you to know. He, he said, about halfway through me talking, I thought, oh, I probably should have let him know I was going to talk about this. <laughs> but the reason Marty McGee works, and this is coming from someone who the first half of my career I was a TV producer, and I worked on a lot of shows where we took really talented people and put them in a room together, and it did not work. And it wasn't their fault. It just didn't work. Mm. And the reason Marty McGee works is we are friends, and I hope everyone can sense that because the, when, when, when people – are kind enough to talk about compliment the show. They talk about, you know, the fact that we're just two dudes talking. And it's just talking. That that show started, he and I were driving to Martinsville together at 6 o'clock in the morning, 11, 12 years ago, and just talking. And it had been a long time since we had done that. And we're just crying. We're laughing so hard for two hours. <laughs> and I remember we got to Martinsville and we parked. And I looked at him and I go, dude, I think people would dig that. Like, I think people would enjoy that conversation. And so we went to ESPN, and to their credit, you know, uh, uh, my friend uh, Sharita, who who now works with NASCAR, she's like, let's just give it a shot. So we did a podcast no one listened to that became a radio show with a terrible time slot in the middle of Saturday afternoon Yeah, that my wife's still mad about. And then they moved it to Saturday morning, and the hilarious part is I'm not a morning person at all, and I (laughs) I co-host a morning show. But but, but this this is all a really long way of saying Marty and I are open with each other. And it kind of goes back to Dale Jr. being open with me with the book. And if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're hiding stuff, it's not going to work. And if you're jealous, it's not going to work. And there have been, as long as we've been doing the show, it was podcast, then it was radio, then it was radio, TV, and now we do the show on the road in the fall. There's been three of those conversations. And there's the one Marty was talking about. And there's one time I called him and just blew him up. I, I was mm-hmm. so angry. But it wasn't about him. It was we were in the middle of covid and we couldn't do the show together, and I'm in the studio, and he was he was somewhere else because they're keeping us separated, separated and all that stuff. And I was I just was so turned up. I had to blow up on somebody, and it was him. And and uh, and but 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 you know we're in we're in an age now where and I'm not comparing us to these people at all, but we're in an age now where Holland Oates are suing each other, right, and not speaking. And Brooks and Dunn don't talk. And. Um, to me, it's just like a, a driver and a crew chief. You know, when it's working, it's working, and you just have to do everything you can do to make it work. Chad Canales and Jimmy Johnson, there were times where they they just talked about the Hall of Fame. They didn't talk to each other, yeah. But they made it work and made it work. So yeah, he he is. And what I love about Marty is that is he is exactly. People ask me all the time, "What's he like?" He's like That's that, him. dude. It is, it is like it from the time he wakes up, he is exactly like that. I swear, I think it at at eleven o'clock at night. His body just freezes and he just falls over in bed and goes to sleep. <laughs> and, and, and because that's just his energy level is just through the roof. But he is, he is all I want from someone is be the genuine article. And there is nothing about Marty Smith that is not genuine. And so, you know, knock on wood, we they pay us in American dollars to do that show. And <laughs> and, and you know, hopefully they'll keep doing it. Mm. I, I should have worn it, but I have the like the original four oh six, like that white yeah. teal oh, yeah. shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the, from way back in the that's day. That's like that's like seeing a Yeti, man. You don't see <laughs> you don't see it. we printed like a hundred of those and every now and then, you know, when we're at we're at L S U or whatever, there's one woman in particular. We're at L S U, she's always you shows always up see with it. thing on. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, the four oh six. We called it four oh six, we only had four hundred and six listeners. <laughs> and in Montana, which is area code four hundred six, right. people would send us all this stuff. Uh, I love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah. So, so knock on wood. Like I say, they they still let us do it. Literally after every show, we walk out in the parking lot at our, our South Charlotte studios, the Wilderness Lodge studios. And Marty looks at me, and I look at him, and I go, "You think we're going to get do it again next week?" <laughs> and he'll say, "Yep," or, or vice versa. That's so. awesome. By the way, that, that Peter Max sweet. car right there, yeah. I got a story about that. We'll we'll we we'll, we'll, we'll tell it later. Yeah. But yeah, that's it's. I've never seen our heart fan so horrified. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It was in Vegas. Good stuff, McGee. That'll wrap it up for Ask McGee okay. Live on YouTube. There you go. Thanks, y'all, for joining us on the interwebs. All right, so I know I'm killing you guys. The show, we're, we're way over. Whatever. Welcome to Marty McGee, right? If you ever, ever listen to the show, we go, we go, we blast through every break, and we just kill. We, we, we go through producers like tissue because we just wear them out, right? So... Uh, including Travis Rockhold in the yeah, building, right? Yeah. We, we, we 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 broke poor Travis. All right, so, um, all right, so I'm holding this car because I love all the stuff that's in here. And if, you, if you're watching on the internet, you can see it. 
This is this is actually this is like a chrome version of this car. It was actually yellow underneath. This is the Peter Max Dell Earnhardt Chevrolet that Senior ran in the All Star race, and it would have been ninety nine two thousand. Probably ran in two thousand. Um, and this was at the height of you know, Richard Childress. I love riding around with Richard, and he'll say, "You know what built this house? What?" He said, "Little bitty three cars." You know what? Pay for that helicopter? What? Little bitty three cars. You know, at the at the height of diecast. So big deal whenever they unveil the deal. And so uh, either ninety nine or two thousand, you ran this in the All Star race, and they unveiled this car in Las Vegas. I think Peter Max is from there or something. And back then, they had the NASCAR Cafe which is right on the corner on the old strip. If you ever watch uh, Vegas Vacation where Nick Papa Giorgio gets his fake idea, that's right where it was. And all these Earnhardt fans were out there, like hundreds of them. And they're going to unveil Dale's paint scheme, Dale Sr.'s paint scheme for the All-Star Race. And they yanked the cover off that thing. And this car was super pink. And if you, if you can't see it, I mean, it's got pink and yellow and a lot, a lot of pink. <laughs> and I'm not lying when I say – it was a gasp. <laughs> like it was a, oh, like, and just silence <laughs> on the strip. And I remember, I remember looking over at her and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Peter Max, incredibly talented artist, a very distinct style. And that was the big, that was the big deal. And, and in fact, Richard Childress in his office has the original prototype die cast that Peter Max had hand painted. And when he had a meeting with him, Peter Max said, Hey, give that to me. And he, and Peter Max signed it and handed it back to Richard because now you put your grandkids through college, because because Peter Max makes so much money, but I mean so much pink on that car, <laughs> and that's when Dale Senior started telling everyone, no no no, my first race car was pink, like trying to, right. but I'll never forget, man. The only other time I saw Dale Senior fans more horrified was <laughs> I was standing at the gate at the Brickyard 400 when he showed up without a mustache, and uh-huh. he had been in the in the with Mikey in the Bahamas and shaved his mustache so his scuba gear would fit. And our snorkel gear would fit. And he showed up in the garage without a mustache. And literally a woman fell to her knees and started <laughs> screaming and crying, No, Dale! No, Dale! <laughs> so between the pink car and Dale Earnhardt and I having a mustache, put that in the McGee Dale Earnhardt stories. But they also sold about 500,000 of these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, again. I'm then, looking at pictures of him without a mustache. Dude, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was pretty it's, wild. It doesn't it look is, real. It was. <laughs> you, you, and now on Instagram, you see these videos where these dads will shave their beard. Oh, and, and then, then they like walk into the room, the, yeah. and their kids just flip out and start crying. The one that kid, like the daughter, starts screaming, no, crawled into the bed. Yep. I shaved my, I've had a beard now for years. I shaved my beard. My daughter was like, nope, <laughs> <laughs> nope. And so, yeah, so I'm was, not comparing my beard to Dale Earnhardt's mustache, but I'm just saying, but when Dale Earnhardt, I literally, because y'all, they, they parked the haulers behind Gasoline Alley. When he walked into that gate, that woman literally started i mean like, like in the movies like oh no like collapse on the ground no dale no so pink race cars and no mustache uh not for even earnhardt dale fans. earnhardt sometimes wasn't as cool as we thought he was that was that was me when uh remember when jimmy showed up to the garage like in whenever the last year for lowe's was and he shaved yeah oh yeah and his beard it looked yeah. so strange yeah and I now, didn't fall to my knees, but well, it was now, very yeah, well, th- well, thank God. Well, now I'm afraid to shave because I'm afraid if I shave it now, it'll grow back completely gray. Like, I don't have any gray hair, but I'm afraid if I shave it. There's a little bit in there, but I'm afraid if I do it now, it'll go completely gray. But, yeah, it's, but y'all, this has been so much fun. I appreciate you having me. Uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate y'all trusting me with the show. And, um, you know, I purposely went really long because I want curling. I had to work <laughs> extra hard, you know, putting this thing together. But, but thank y'all for having me, and hopefully uh, – Hopefully we get to do it again sometime. Yeah, Absolutely. Thanks for being here. It was a blast having you, McGee. Yeah, thank y'all. And by, by the way, it's time for the white flag, right? It is. See? Let's See, put you it didn't out. Think I was gonna do it. Next flag ends the race. All right. So, uh, we, we, I, by the way, the amount of content you guys are cranking out right now is phenomenal. And, I under, and there's probably going to be more coming down the road. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> right. It's awesome. So much content. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, so Jeff Gluck, Jordan Bianchi. By the way. Speaking of pink, our long national nightmare is over <laughs> with, the, with the Gluck wearing the suit thing. I literally, all that rain at Daytona, I went back to my room and put it on YouTube as I'm getting dressed for Sunday morning. Or no, for Monday to yeah, go back yeah, to the track. Yeah. And I'm, I'm watching on YouTube in the room, and it's I'm watching there, and it's, and it's the, the, the unveiling of the uh, – of the suit, yeah. Same woman fell to her knees. When well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well what I love center. about Jordan is he's so great at his job. And, and Gluck, uh, both of them are just amazing. And they're kind of, you know, there's a small handful of them kind of carrying the bucket right now in that media center, and, and I'm so appreciative. But Jordan, when we do the retro deal at Darlington, and I would show up dressed as Curse of Conor Mackey or whatever, and everybody would have these old 
clothes, funky clothes on. Jordan just wear his regular clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I love these throwback. Throw throw right, right, right. All right, so <laughs> those two guys recap the action from Las Vegas Sunday night on the teardown. Uh, Denny Hamlin, as we mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, he got back from Vegas and has an in-depth analysis on where uh, his team – 23. 20, mm -hmm. the, the team that he owns. Mm -hmm. I, by the way, I love I love all my stick and ball friends who watch the Netflix show calling and going, now wait a minute. So he drives for one team mm -hmm. and he owns another team. How does that work? I go, this is very complicated, yeah. but it's been, been like this for a while. Dale Earnhardt did it. Yep. Uh, and he uh, wants to talk about his team, how they can improve his organization on Actions Detrimental, which is available now. Door Bumper Clear uh, had Truck Series winner Roger Carruth, which yep. we talked about earlier on the show. That's certainly worth a listen. I always like listening to... Uh, to DBC and then uh, and then text to Mike and going, are you in trouble? Because because uh, they almost always say something that makes somebody mad, which makes them great. Uh, another episode of Speed Street drops tomorrow. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what Connor and Chase have in store for us. And Dirty Mo Doe with Steve Latart will return Thursday to preview everything ahead of Phoenix. By the way, we live here in North Carolina, right? March eleventh. Sports betting becomes oh, yeah. Man, are they wearing us out? Mm, Holy already. cow. So you dirty mo dope. If you That's live in North Carolina, you, gotta go you can apply this. Exactly right. But yeah, fan do all, all, all it's like but every commercial break of everything I watch now is, is you know, somebody fan somebody duel. reminding me yeah. yeah that you can bet on sports in North Carolina. So yeah, but it's uh but, but all the info that you need to do that, if you are a fellow North Carolinian and all the other states where where uh such entertainment is legal, <laughs> then uh, Dirty Mode Doe can hook you up. But boys, it's been so much fun. Well, plus I have to add here real quick. Yeah. Tomorrow, Business Motorsports. Oh Kelly yeah, is yeah. Back. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh yeah. No, Brian no, no. Carter of uh, World Racing Group yep. is going to be here. Well, and 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 it is it has been. Yeah, I, I talk all the time about seeing Dale Jr. race for the first time at Myrtle Beach. Kelly raced in that race too, and to see what she has done and continues to do. And has managed to do it while the economy, the, the economic model of the sport has changed dramatically over and over and over again. Looking right out the window at these dudes working out here. I mean, just what, what she has accomplished. That's why our book is so good. You know, that drive book is so good because it's, um, it's obviously about her dad. It's about those things. But, but there's a lot of, um, I, I was sorry, read that book if you have a business of any size because of what she's done. So, yeah, I look forward to it. I always learn something when I listen to her. Yeah, Brian Carter is going to be great. Like, you can bet they're going to talk about world of outlaws oh yeah the high limit deal like yeah that's how, and how do you watch. how do you survive in that world in this time you know yeah that, that's what 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 they do and they you have to love it you know you have to love it I, i've become really good friends with the series director at arca our daughters go to school together and, and and what what those guys do um they love it you know nobody's getting rich man they're just doing it because they love it and 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 those guys you're talking about i mean outlaws only race 14 times a week so <laughs> yeah how, oh how, how, how you pull that off i have no idea but uh, hey this has been great and uh it's been awesome this yeah, has awesome. been this has been <laughs> awesome <laughs> this show's been awesome ryan mcgee that's right i'm at the beach y'all <laughs> i hope mcgee was awesome so i appreciate it boys